Today in episode 13, Jim Semivan continues his conversation with co-founder and visionary Tom DeLong, where they consider some of the biggest questions and theories about the phenomenon that have been posed by their favorite authors, advisors, and academics. I'm Jim Semivan, and welcome to episode 13 of TTS Talks. Today we are continuing our conversation with our special guest, Tom DeLong. Those of you who tuned in earlier for episode 12 heard Tom's viewpoints on a variety of aspects of the phenomenon and UAPs, and today we want to continue that conversation and develop a better understanding of the mind of Tom DeLonge. So once again, here is musician, writer, director, actor, businessman, entrepreneur, and chairman of the board of To The Stars, Mr. Tom DeLonge. Tom, welcome back, and thanks for making the time to be with us today. You know, this is... uh... This is fun because, you know, when I met you, like, however many, six years ago or whatever it's been, we would just talk like this on the phone. But now we're just letting people kind of listen to our phone calls is basically what we're doing. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, that's really a great way to put it. Uh, um, you know, last time we chatted, you know, we discussed your new movie, Monsters of California, your views about UAPs and the phenomenon, your relationship with the uh, quote unquote original advisors. And how you and TTS want to present the idea of the phenomenon to the public. We also spent some time on religion and its relationship to the phenomenon, the idea of prayer and meditation and connecting to the source and how this could potentially open up your mind to connecting with the phenomenon. It was really a a fascinating conversation and I wanted to continue in the same vein today. And, And once again, thanks. I know you're really busy, but thanks a lot for taking the time, you know, to do this. You know, we talked about John Keel last time, and we're both big fans of John Keel's. But here's another question, and that question is, do you believe that the UFO phenomenon is reflective? Now, Keel suggested as much when he stated that the observed manifestations of the UFO phenomenon seem to be deliberately tailored and adjusted to the individual beliefs and mental attitudes of the witnesses. Both the objects and their occupants appear to be able to adopt a multitude of forms and the contactees are usually given information that conforms to their own beliefs. So, do you think it is reflective? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, um, I remember years ago, uh, and I might have said this when we were talking on the last one. Um, there was a guy that was a, a parapsychologist at UCLA, and I think it was UCLA, and he was a professor there or something, and he was studying poltergeist events. And what he found out was like, if if you're sitting at your house in a a book kind of moves across the shelf and you kind of kind of scares you but you're like wow that's weird there's a ghost in here you know that's all you'll see but if you're the same person and that book moves across the shelf and it really scares you like you scream and it just startles like you jump that book will then fly off the shelf and possibly hit you in the head more fear you have from an event the more the poltergeist uh activity will will amplify itself so then you'll start getting hit with things in the room. You'll start getting scratched. I mean, it just goes, it, it gets, it, it, more things happen to the person who's more fearful. Um, and so what I've always wondered about the, the, the UFO or UAP phenomenon, and as well as all the paranormal events that have gone back through a very long period of time, it seems to be very reflective of the person's belief systems and the nature of their existence at the time. Now, if you're looking at just hardware, you know, you have these, you know, you have, uh, airship mystery in the late 1800s that looked kind of steampunk, you know, it's like kind of like a big traveling pirate ship in the sky or something. That's all we could envision at the time for modes of transport. Um, but then later on, you know, you have things that are flying um, in the 30s and 40s that look a little bit more like flying wings. It's always just like a little bit outside of our technological path that we're in. It's almost like it's showing us something or crashes something and then like gives us like kind of an engineering North Star, maybe. You know, I always thought that was weird. Um, versus a lot of UFOs now, because we have flying wings like the B-2 bomber and whatever. It's like now when we see a UFO, it's more of an orb of light and it stretches and bends and moves or whatever. It's always like a little bit further than what we're able to engineer. But when you also look at entities themselves, you know, you have things like trolls, leprechauns, fairies, you have angels and demons, you have the Greek gods, or you have the angels of the Bible or or whatever. But depending on like where you're at in, in as far as geography goes, it'll show you something that is more along like your Celtic belief systems or your pagan belief systems or your Christian or, or Greek mythology belief systems. And again, it's something that is either leading you into a certain type of mind, mind frame, or it's leading you to become more fearful, or it's leading you 
to like quit your job or leave your wife. You just, I mean, I don't know. It seems like it's always doing something that you will kind of understand or expect, or you can kind of define. And, um, and then it affects you in some weird way that changes your behavior. And, um, and I think that's one of the things that heal was really figuring out was like, people are seeing like a winged creature on a bridge or they're having a, uh, an alien event like in their own bedroom or they're seeing a craft in the sky, but it's all, all of those things, no matter how different they are, are doing the same thing to the individual, which made him kind of find more of the patterns of how they're all connected rather than disparate between once, uh, uh, one another. And I think, I think him and Jacques Vallée were very much like, wait, look at the absurdity of all this stuff. Yeah. Right. Because it looks like it's all doing the same thing, and um, uh, and, and I, that's that's really where I was always like focusing my attention was like, what are the commonalities and the patterns within all these things? Because you can start to think they're all totally different, but sometimes they're kind of doing the same exact thing. I mean, so I, I think that's where we should be looking. Because if there is like a big, you know, malleable kind of um, frequency that we live in, or, or maybe there's a big machine that's pointing some type of energy at our system and and it's and it clues into what we think and can show us back what we think. I mean, Colin Kelleher on the ATIP program wrote about the mimicry program stuff that they were noticing with UFOs, that UFOs would show up and change shape and look like an F-18 and then look like something else. It was almost like, or a helicopter. You know, right. it's like it was changing what it looked like based on what we were doing or just to confuse us, you know? So- is everything a hologram? Is everything we see that leads us down a path, you know, reflective of what we're thinking? Well, I think John Keel started started noticing that. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's a great observation. You know, I, I always think of our friend uh, uh, Chris Bledsoe, who who had this, you know, when he had this experience back in two thousand and eight. You know, here's a guy suffering very very severely from uh, an illness. He asks the heavens, you know, you know, for help, and then you know these uh, UAPs or UFOs show up. Um, he is then cured uh, of his illness, but when he meets the lady, you know, the lady shows up not too uh, much longer after that, hands him another burden. Um, you know, this with the little fuzzy thing, they, they, they put his hands out and he, they laid it in there and said, this is your burden. This is what you have to do. And, and he took that to mean that he has to basically talk about this. Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, is he, he, it's almost like he exchanged one burden for another. Um, I don't know if he would consider a burden, what he's doing now, a burden at all. I mean, he seems to be, you know, right there, but what's interesting about it is the absolute absurdity of some of this stuff. Uh, I mean, just how the hell do you explain the lady? How do you explain, uh, you know, a bull charging out, coming out of nowhere? I, you know, it, it, and it, it's almost like these guys, whoever this this phenomena is, wants it to sound and look absurd, so it's not believable. I don't know. You know so I, I'm actually, you know, I've, I've been thinking this for a long time because a lot of the ancient texts talk about this, and then some of the stuff in the U, UAP kind of category talks about this. The idea of free will. If you go back to the double slit experiment, where they're basically everything is a wave until a human brain can think of something and then it becomes a particle. It's like they're figuring out that matter is literally like we're, we are a transducer. So our, your entire body is transducing some type of source wave into physical matter. Now, if there was in, in uh, some type of intelligence that can't break into this realm, because this realm is just, we're transducing the physical matter. We're transducing our own environment. But this other force really wants in. But the only way it can get in is if it scares you and tricks you to thinking something. And then you think something, identify it, believe it, and then make it reality. That could be really interesting in the sense of why the, the, the UFO phenomenon wants so badly people to potentially talk about it and bring it out to the open and tell Chris Blitz yeah. it's Burden and Fatima in all these huge events to get all these people thinking about it. The next thing you know, we're transducing its reality into our environment. That's, that's a pretty scary place to be. Cause then I go, shit, maybe we should never have talked about this in the first place. You know, I know it's skinnery. And in a sense, it is like behavior modification. And I know that, um, uh, you know, valet talked a lot about this, the idea of periodicity, you know, and, and, um, 
uh, where you insert these kind of experiences into people's lives or the population's lives and you pull it out and then you push it back and then you pull it out and people come used to it. Um, and you also talked about this just a second ago about the trickster element. There is indeed a trickster element. I've had numerous cases over the last couple of years where people have called me up and you really smart people, you know, uh, who, um, uh, you know, you know, well, they, they've had these experiences, either they're contactees or somebody's got a hold of them and said, Hey, you know, these beings have told me, you know, the world's going to end or they're going to land on some lawn or something. And they could, do you think it'd be a good idea to notify the government? You know, and my answer is always the same. No, uh, no, they're not going to, we're not going to do that. And yeah, I'm not saying that they won't in the future, but generally speaking, um, uh, these kind of things generally don't happen. It's it's a form of apocalypticism or millennialism, you know, and you, we had that all through our history of people, you know, you know, talking about the end of the world or what, what happening. And I said, but for some reason or other, they're telling these people this. They haven't lied to them for a long time. And then all of a sudden they're lying to them now and can't quite figure it out. But let me ask you a question along those lines. Uh, about non-human intelligences, uh, you know, a lot of UAP researchers think, including Valet, that these non-human intelligences may be intelligent beings from space who have been watching our planet for thousands of years and who have intervened in human history more than once. Other researchers like Keel think that they are mostly poltergeists. And he quotes and he said, simply the juvenile delinquents and time wasters of the spirit world. I'm torn between this. I, I'm not quite sure which which one. What do you think? You know, I I'm, I I think it's the artist brain that I'm always trying to visualize how it all works. And and I I think like you know we see three dimensions, but I obviously physics and quantum physics they're they're really trying to get us to rationalize multiple dimensions. So there's all these different types of shapes that fit into one point. You know, and so I go I I don't really think of these intelligences coming from a different planet, nor from necessarily the vacuum of space i kind of think it's like the radio where you can tune into any frequency and you're just in your car and you can you can listen to this station or that station depending on the frequency that you're tuned into so i kind of tend to think that like if if there's all these things from the the past and the future existing in the same place just separated by frequency they just bleed into one another that's how my brain works on it rather than things that are sitting there watching us from another planet or another galaxy. I'm not saying that that can't happen either, but I, I have a sense that like, um, that there's things that have gotten, you know, the way I, I don't know. It's like when I look at this, the normal gray alien that we see on t-shirts that you see like, you know, and, and uh, on the internet, you know, like the, the, the drawing, the famous drawing, you know, when I think of these things and people's experiences with them, the only thing, the, I, like when I get rid of everything on the table and the only thing I have left, that really seems to make sense to me is that something created these and maybe the something that created them aren't even around anymore and these things went off and just replicated across the universe it and like crazy it, super far down the road like like they they've been around for so long and their timeline is so far further along in advance that they can they can literally hop through time and then they saw us and they just like a bunch of like flies on dog shit they're just like just all around it, not knowing what we're all about and really messing things up and getting and 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 it's it's really messed up the, a normal evolution of humanity based on their influence of of a synthetic kind of intelligence but then you kind of wonder like i don't think they're the only thing here based on what people see and experience but who's controlling these things or whatever controlled them are they gone you know um I, the reason I'm saying all this is like, I just don't think it's necessarily someone left a certain planet and watched us. And then to, I think it's these things are traversing in a quantum physics kind of way versus just a linear way. Yeah. So I, I think they stumble upon it maybe and then try to manage it over a long period of time. But like Heel said and Jacques Vallée would always say, it's like, you know, is this planet, it's kind of, it's their anthill that they found, you know, so yeah. owned, owned by somebody. Um, when you look back to the drawings of some of the ancient stuff in, in Egypt and Sumer and like uh, all over the world, I mean, they have the and petroglyphs of the First Nations tribes and all that stuff. They all have the big head with the big black eyes, 10 yeah. to 20,000 years old written sometimes, I think even further. 
So they've been seeing these entities forever, you know? So right. these things have come and gone. And um, so it's like, I, were they watching us or have we always been owned and they just pop up from time to time? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's a real puzzle. I, I, I certainly don't know what to make of it. You know, let me, let me jump forward to a, another, another question I wanted to ask is, you know, a lot of times you and I've discussed this idea of consensus reality, you know, the reality which most of us experience on a daily basis. And we know that our brain and our senses are limited and act somewhat akin to a filtering system, allowing in only so much information and preventing us from an information overload. So my question is, you know, do you believe there is an ultimate reality? And and do you think it is essentially unknowable given our limited senses and blinkered brain? And in the end, given in our inability to fathom what is truly going on, it, you know, is it even worth thinking about? I mean, you know, there, there, are, there are people, I remember John Kielter in his life was like, you know, screw this, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, what, what did I come up with at the, in the end? Uh, you know, yeah, that this stuff exists, but I can't figure it out. I can't tell you how many times I walk away from this only to come back because e either you or somebody else calls me up, you know, and says, Hey, did you hear about, and then get interested. Huh. But what do you think about it? You, you, you think this, this is the ultimate reality or you think it is, is it maybe another step to the ultimate reality or well, I think You know, it's like, I think when we sleep, your consciousness leaves your body and traverses source, you know, that's why, yeah. You know, your consciousness is just not in your bedroom. It's going through all the variations of the things that are happening everywhere else. And and so I think, but then we awake, when we're awake, we're just, all that's real is what's right in front of you. So I don't think there is a consensus reality because if we were to fly over to like the hills, the Himalayas right now and talk to some tribe up there, you know, I mean, their reality is very different. They're not watching TV necessarily. They're walking up, you know, the the, the, the steep sides of mountains with like, donkeys and burrows or whatever the hell they got up there you know like so their their reality is so much different than ours so i don't know if there is one consensus reality and i also know when we each sleep we're traversing for half of the day something else entirely um so and i you know i i, I that's why when people do like ketamine and D, dmt and some of these drugs that let let your consciousness depart from your body they tend to see a little bit more even when they're awake um i don't know i mean I do think that there's, I mean, that's, I really do think there's something important about going back to that double sl slit exper experiment, because I, what they're basically saying is like when a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound if no one's there to hear it? And the scientists are saying, no, that it's so different. The tree doesn't exist unless there's a human to see it. Around the corner, it is expecting to see a tree. So a tree is there. And it's almost like they imprinted a physical matter tree in like a, a, pub, a public server, like the video game Minecraft. So somebody else can walk around the mountain and see the tree that another person put there. You know, it's like, so we all imprint what we believe is real. And um, if you can get the greater consensus of the world believing in UFOs, we might all start imprinting that here. And that intelligence that doesn't have a right to be here is now let in potentially because we're con our consensus is that that's the whole thing with Fatima. So um, you remember probably a lot more detail about Fatima than I do. It was a three days, UFOs, entities in the sky, 30, 40,000 people a day, prophecies. The lady, right. the lady came out, the same one that Chris Bledsoe talks about in North Carolina or whatever, um, the same one that showed up to the Mojave incident where two people stayed up all night, were abducted all night long with a bunch of greys. Horrible, horrible, scary story. But then the lady came out and said, we're super sorry about all your torture. You know, but right. like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like, um, but it's the same thing where you're trying to do, you know, you're getting these big events where people are talking about it, writing books and influencing everybody. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I have a new model I'm working on. This is my okay. new model. This. Right. this is scary. Well, you always tell me new models. You always give me new models. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Go ahead. I have this feeling. This is the something far out, but I'm sitting here kind of going, okay, so you have this crazy advanced civilization that's been going on way longer than us, can create matter, manipulate matter, and do weird things. Maybe it's using energies of a star. Maybe it's using antimatter energies to slam things together and can literally create matter. Can it create something like our moon and put our moon into orbit? 
And our, our moon is the only moon in the entire solar system that doesn't have an elliptical orbit, doesn't rotate the same way, and it has all these mysteries around it. And I'm kind of going, is that like a machine that just like something cyclically keeps life like ebbing and flowing over long, large eons of time because we're being used for some purpose, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, some giant computer sitting in that weird thing and it's just pointed at us. And anytime we think of a flying saucer, it shows us the flying saucer is a hologram. Anytime we sleep or we die, it comes in and fucks around with our consciousness. That's kind of the new thing. I'm Because apparently I heard on Coast to Coast one time, I think George Knapp talked about it. There is sp potentially a civilization that wrote down the time before the moon, like super old, like right. they're they would they wrote in their books or on their petroglyphs that there was a time before the moon was here. I'm like, well, who parked that shit in our orbit? So I'm wondering if you want to get up there, figure out what's going on, let me know. But that's my new thing I'm worried about. Well, I like that. I like that idea. I, I you know, it's, it's there's, it's a you know, it's a quantum concept. The idea that you create reality, you know, on in these these microseconds, right? You know that you know yet. You, your consciousness or your brain just creates this stuff, you know, as you go along, you don't see it because it happens so fast. And I know in Eastern cultures, um, uh, I remember uh, reading the story about this young, young woman who, uh, um, gosh, this was, this goes back 20 or 30 years, but who uh, had the gift of uh, somehow rather changing the reality around her, even when people were present. Um, really? Really? Yeah, and and there was a you know, and she was a very playful young young lady, but just you know, and the people that were there were like you know, in, in, they were in the middle of an oasis, you know, you know, with palm trees and water and stuff, and then all of a sudden they start dancing around, you know, within a few minutes they were in a, in a complete desert. Now, you know, how did she do that? I don't. I mean, people didn't know. It's um, I remember the uh, you know, the I was a British or American Psychical Research Association. I can't remember, but. When, uh, you know, they watched one of these guys, you know, a bunch of scientists of the day around 1890s and stuff and watched one of their one of their own, you know, levitate. And he levitated right out the damn window, sitting in a chair and the chair levitated. He went out the window, circled around and came back in and sat the chair down. That would have been fucking scary. <laughs> no, the, you know, you know, and, these, and these, you know, these were scientists. They, they weren't, you know, they weren't making this stuff up. So. I don't know. Well, let, this, let me, this goes back to this ultimate thing, you know, I, I want to talk to you about because you and I have discussed this medieval concept of the great chain of being before the idea that God is at the top of the food chain, followed by angels and humans and so on. You think there's a possibility that this phenomenon is either what we would consider God or God-like, or maybe perhaps like us, a part of something greater. In other words, it's it's not the ultimate form it's it's like us it it, it it has a place in all this and doesn't have all the answers either because uh you know if you read people who had near-death experiences a lot of them will tell you that when when they die and they have these wonderful experiences and they feel all this great love and compassion and they have a this understanding you know of the universe that they never had when they were living here on earth but when you question them about well did you have all the answers and the question is no there, there's always something beyond that what do you think well, it's weird because the early advisors I had, and these guys were all like multiple stars on their shoulders, have been running whatever programs they couldn't tell me about, but it was an understanding that they knew what they were fucking talking about. I always found it really interesting that there was a handful of them that had a religion, like had a little bit of religious belief, but they weren't, it's almost like they were going to church, not because they believed in the dogma, but they believed in the basic core principle of positive thought and love um something about a force of good and evil fighting each other like we're at the like i always t said before it's like we're at the event horizon between two competing forces there's something about that concept that they that they actually took to heart after they left the government you know and i remember yeah. going you know one of them uh was very was very much like well who are these tall whites that we always hear about in the ufo literature and he goes, and one would stop and he would just go, well, what are angels? And I said, well, I guess angels were considered messengers. He's all, they're messengers. You know, so it was a very practical look at the religion type right. thing and how they applied it, but they weren't religious. You know, um, I always thought that was really interesting. Um, but there was only one um, of the the main, main kind of advisor that that you and I have discussed where he was the only person that was like, you know, because I'd always bring up like in the literature, you kind of have like 
you know, you have your grays with the big black eyes and you have your tall whites that look like the, you know, the Greek gods or the angels of the Bible or whatever. So it, uh, there's all these other things that people see, but those are kind of like the two main ones. You have your Nordic type good ones and you have your like little clone bad ones. Um, but he was the only one that said, well, who created, who created the the good ones? You know, who created them? Who are they really? You yeah. Know? And that was the only thing that I was like bombed hearing because I was like, I thought there were some good ones out there and he was the only one that was like, but who created them? Who are they really? You know, you can't have bug-eyed monsters talking to humans and scaring them out, scaring them. Maybe something that looks more like them is easier to digest. And I was like, oh, God, here we go. <laughs> like, here we go. Pain does it all work. So my, my concept here, my working concept, which is very much like a boat on a river, it's always moving and fucking who knows where I'm going to end up with it. But I believe there is one source energy that created all life. But I believe that all forms of life are just, once it's started, just moves into entropy, just starts breaking apart and breaking away. And somewhere in that, in that chain of events, certain life can adapt. And if it's a human being, we might adapt ourselves synthetically over time. We might take computers and merge it into our brains. The internet becomes wireless into our bodies, minds. We might turn our body a little bit more cyborg-like, you know, and pretty soon once you start doing that to, to, stave off entropy, you end up becoming more synthetic yourself and you lose emotion, maybe because you become more controllable and societies can only work when there's less emotion or whatever. But at some point you lose your attachment to source over a long period of time. Right. And then you get the means and the synthetic abilities, the technological abilities to travel amongst time and work your way back and try to figure out how to, to fix what you've done to yourself but you don't know how necessarily because you're pretty much a computer at that time. And since you can't be everywhere all at once, you create a bunch of little robots that can go out and do it for you. And they're all programmed. And next thing you know, you have all these programmed people at different levels out of control, doing things and messing up things. And maybe that's a little bit what's going on too. I don't know. Um, I don't even yeah. know if I answered the question, but it all starts from one energy source. I think there's one energy source. There's, there's single mind. There's unity. There's unified love. When people die, they feel that you feel oneness. When you love something, right. you love a person, you want to be one with that person. And then the opposite of that, the duality of that is individual individualism, is is the is you're on your own and you're just a number. And and that's why I think the biggest movies of all time have all been about that. It's artists that are getting ideas from one source, which is like Star Wars. You have a group of free will human beings that the more they get in touch with the force source, they can move objects with their mind. They can meditate, be different places. They can have access to all information and they and it's full of love and it's service to others, not just yourself. But on the flip side, you got these stormtroopers. They're like clones. They come in, everything's really controlled and they're still using the same power. And there's, it's a yin and a yang, you know, so you can either end up like North Korea or you can end up like the United States, you know, it's like yeah, these right. two, eating forces and i honestly think and that's been in the avengers movies that's been in the lord of the rings movies it's been in the star wars movies and i don't think something someone's beaming that to the artists that are writing this i think that we all get our ideas from the same place you know um and i think the reason why the biggest stories of mankind the joseph campbell stuff and all that even the bible and all that it still boils down to us like having a strong connection to source versus those who don't have it and 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 it's that kind of battle that's been going on since the dawn of man i guess yeah that's interesting well let me let me throw something along those lines you just said you know when we started to the stars a while back uh we took a little bit of flack because we were talking about we weren't going along with the uh the idea that the phenomenon was always a great beneficial thing we were saying like look let's just wait there's been instances where it hasn't been. I mean, if you look at, you know, I always like to use Chris Chris Bledsoe as an example. He's he's just a, just a dear dear man. But when you listen to his story, uh, you know, uh, you know, up close and personally, and you could see the absolute fear that he went through and his family went through when he first encountered uh, these beings uh, and this phenomena, and then later on how it transformed him into a very very deeply spiritual man and and healer. So you see this dichotomy, and if you talk to Chris, Chris will tell you, no, you know, this is this is a beneficial thing. Uh, and then you know you run into guys like 
Keel uh, and and uh, you know even Jacques Vallée to a certain extent. Well, they'll tell you, well, no, no, hold on a second, uh, uh, because I remember when when I had my experience, uh, I was visited. Uh, it was years years after my experience, but but um, I had met John Alexander at a at a conference, and John put me in touch with some people, and. Um, and then next thing I know, Jacques Vallée, you know, the guy, right, the, the house god of TTS, calls me up and says, can I come out and see you? So he he flew out from San Francisco, went, came to my house in Virginia, and spent the day with my wife and I. And uh, and we had some very, very long, involved conversations about this. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, what I what I experienced, you know, you know, physical marks, the whole thing, and, uh, and my wife's worse. Uh, I said, do you think this is evil? And he said, he said, he said, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, he said, I don't think anybody knows. He said, but I will tell you one thing. He said, what I do know is that you can, you can say that it's basically indifferent. It's indifferent to, to man. In other words, people get harmed by walking into it or getting caught in it, but it doesn't seem to have an evil intention per se. But then when you read Keel and, you know, you read the Mothman and, and a lot of these other stories like, you know, the Mojave incident, well, holy cow, and you look at this stuff and, you know, you get these hobgoblins flying around, um, uh, you know, with uh, Jay, you know, Jay Stratton, you know, he's got orbs flying around in his house, scaring the hell out of his wife and his kids. Uh, I don't see, I don't know where there's any kind of a, a spiritual turn to that, where you can look at all that and all of a sudden you say, Oh, you know, now I'm a better person. It happened with Chris and, and, you know, great for him. Sure as hell didn't happen to me. And I don't think it happened to Jay Stratton either. I think it gave Jay a, a different outlook as with me, but shit, I mean, nothing I couldn't have got from reading books. What do you think? I think like, yeah, I, you know, the idea of what, what we, we might call something evil just, but to that, it's like, you know, are we evil when we go fishing and we hurt fish, <laughs> you know, are we considered yeah. evil to it? So it's, things looking out for its own interest. The thing that I look at, you know, um, a lot of the ideas of good and evil come from like religion, all different types of religions where it really defines the metaphysical nature of who we are and what we're living in. But when I look at religion, I cannot think of one religion that hasn't left a wake of destruction from, it, I mean, literally every single one has done so much harm on um, and the one pattern in all these religions is it, it most of them outside of the pagan ones have really tried to just to get us to believe that the creator of the universe is some kind of human or or something it's not like a source and energy it's like it's it's a, it's a jesus or an allah or it's or it's um you know a buddha or i don't know i don't buddhism doesn't really say that but but you know my point is it's trying to human humanize something and so um so to me, it's like when Chris Bledsoe or some of these others that have these kind of spiritual experiences, these are the exact same experiences that are written about throughout the entire Bible in the Quran and like all these other texts. And um, all of them are are really setting the stage for us to worship the UFO and their occupants to some degree. Like we're, and that's, to me is the one strong pattern is to confuse us and not let us know of our own spiritual nat nature to source consciousness. And as long as we don't know that, um, th then, then we will think that, okay, the aliens like, like fucked with our DNA and made us like this, or the tall whites showed up and they were the Greek gods too. And they gave us philosophy and all this, whatever. It's like, we're always like giving some kind of humanized form credit for everything. And the one thing that's common in all these religions is that it's not giving credit to source energy uh, that allows us to heal, that allows us to be telepathic, that allows us uh, to be have telekinesis, that allows us to have like compassion and, and energy healing. Like whether you you do Reiki and meditate or whether you sit and pray, it doesn't matter. Why does it work in every religion? Because it's source energy. It's not about the religion. But if you look at oh, who's responsible for all the religions, well, it's whatever UFO the Star of Bethlehem was or whatever UFO the Fatima thing was or whatever the tall white was that met with Joseph Smith, sort of the Mormon religion was, or whatever the jinn are that are in the Quran or whatever the demons are that are in the Old Testament. They seem to be the things that come in that take you when you sleep and make you think things and deceive you. It's all the same. So you have all these things fucking with you as the good ones and the bad ones. 
but all the religions, the pattern is, is never, ever, ever let humans know the physics of their existence, which is meditate. You can heal somebody and have all your information you need or pray. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter, you know, but so I, that's, that's how I, that's, that's more like my line of thinking is, is why it's so important for, for us to understand the true nature of spirituality and why I step back when I hear the Chris Bledsoe stories. And it's wonderful that he's gotten to a place that it's helping him because I really do like him as a person. And I really respect and honor his experiences because I firsthand um, have heard them from him. And I, he's just a wonderful human. I mean, with an incredible story. But I told him personally, I said, I would be very careful giving this, giving this, these entities that are fucking with you, like all this great credit and and putting them on a pedestal because these are the same groups that have been doing a lot of weird shit throughout time, good and bad. And um, that to me seems, you know, seems that seems suspect, you know, it seems like if there is any really true, beautiful, great force and entities representing that force, like your angels in the Bible. I'm, I mean, even in the Bible, people would, um, you know, they would, when they saw an angel, they would collapse on the ground in extreme fear. And like, they couldn't even look at them. It was like the scariest thing that's ever happened. And, um, and that doesn't sound like a real loving interaction to me. <laughs> that sounds like some yeah. scary shit, you know? So I think whatever would represent true love and, and unparalleled love, that doesn't seem to be showing up and fucking with our society and our timelines and our behaviors and trying to manage us. It's letting us do it yeah. on, our, on our own, you know, like, like figure it out on your own, you know, but everything else that's showing up seems to have its own interest at heart. It's, it's uh, you know, I, 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 I tend to agree with you on this. I, I had, I had, I did a podcast a while back and somebody related to this and, and my, you know, my, my, my idea was, look, you know, you know, they were, they were talking about why, why, you know, why ha there hasn't been disclosure. And I said, well, you know, there's two sides of this story. I said, you have the non-human intelligences, you know, or the phenomenon, and then you have the governments. And I said, well, where the hell are, where the hell are the, um, non-human intelligences and all this why aren't they coming out they're pretty sneakily running around and they meet people in you know in in uh, you know weird obscured circumstances make their experiences sound crazy yet they sort of want to be known but they don't want to be known you know as i mentioned somebody wants to that you know they'll they'll screw around with you but you can't you can't take them home you know to meet your parents i mean it's it's, it's not something that they're gonna, they're not landing on the white house lawn for a reason i i'm not quite sure what what that amounts to uh, I remember getting a briefing once uh, years ago uh, by a fellow whom you know, but I won't mention because I didn't like to be mentioned ever. Uh, he, you know, he was telling me about the orbs, and this I think this might have come out about the family as a guy, his wife, and a daughter were driving uh, down in, out, out in the southwest somewhere, and these orbs they encountered some orbs, some green and blue orbs, but the orbs came into the car. You know, and and one of them, you know, went through, uh, went through. I think the wife, and uh, caused an enormous amount of problems. And I think she eventually died. And the other one banged into the girl or the guy and hit them and caused problems in their shoulders and stuff like that. It wasn't a very pleasant thing. My wife and I were part of that study, the interference syndrome study that you know, Gary and and Kit worked on. Uh, and uh, you know. You heard horror stories about some of these people who had, who had you know, encounters with people. So I, and I'm glad that that people who've had these experiences had positive experiences, or their negative experiences turned positive and they changed. I mean, you know, John Mack wrote a lot about that um, uh, in Abduction and uh, uh, Passport to the Cosmos. Uh, the wonderful stories about people whose lives have been changed for the better. But yet, there's also that 10 or 20 percent who. Yeah, things well, aren't look, great. Yeah. I look at like the major religions as being UFO events that spurred thinking and spurred, you know, the evolution of, you know, like the, the like what they, the, the, that, that caused the Inquisition, you know? So it's, yeah. like, you know, these guys see like talking bushes and UFO light in the sky, star of Bethlehem type stuff. And then they go on and kill millions and millions of people, you know? So, I look at that as like a symptom from UFO events as well. And every religion has that stuff. 
And I and I and you, what you the point you brought up how they're not just landing here and showing themselves. I, I keep I keep going back to this thought that like I think there's a preparation of our DNA um, to where they can they can somehow merge with us with their consciousness. But our DNA, but the only way we can do that is through free will choice. Like if they just showed up and forced everything, it fucks up. It doesn't prepare the DNA in the, in the right way or something. Free will has a matter. It matters in a physics way, in some weird, weird way down to the base level of our DNA, I believe. <clears throat> so it has to influence us and deceive us and create religions and create mystical events and show us back and mimic things when we're in a forest, whether it's a troll or a leprechaun. It's like something is fucking forcing us to make free will decisions to stay in a state of chaos that evolves our DNA and consciousness to a, to a point rapidly to where it can become inhabited or something. I mean, that, that makes a lot more sense to me um, why it's not showing up and why it doesn't want to be known. Because the other thing is, if we knew they were here and we knew what they were doing, maybe when it comes in your room at night, you would say, get the fuck out of here. And it's like, it can't get what it wants and it leaves, you know, it's like, all right, yeah. right. can't force you to give your consciousness and your, and your soul over, you know, it's like, you kind of got to be a part of that by getting into, getting into drugs, getting into war, like trying, you know, like doing the hating the marriage you're in. I maybe like being boxed into any kind of belief system that your particular geography and religion tells you what to do. And, and it makes you go wild after a while and you didn't live a really beautiful life based on just free choice and experience because you yeah. had to have the wife, you had to have the kids, you had to have the job, you had to have, you know, like all these things, but, in, but everyone's on antidepressants and no one's actually really that happy. And seven out of 10 marriages are ended in divorce and kids hate fucking school. They hate school. Like what is, we're not doing something right towards the happiness of our soul. Um, but and what we are doing is we're in constant war with other countries over belief systems and over just the cultures, you know? And, and so I just have a feeling like something's really radically wrong with humanity. And these things are the only thing that's been constant for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, written on petroglyphs, written in ancient texts and written through mystical experiences. And, and, um, so I just look at the patterns, like, why are they not showing up in mass necessarily? Well, because it's trying to create the, the situation we're in. Well, what do they get out of it? Well, they get a lot of death. They get a lot of pain. They get a lot of fear. They get a lot of rapidly advancing information. And the ecosystem is like going into a fucking crazy state of entropy at all times. You know this more than anyone being at the CIA. Yeah. That just seems like the most stressful job in the world. Every day you get someone to hand you a file of where else something's burning on earth. You know, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it never it stops. It, no, it never stops. And it does get to you. And you look at that and you say, is this just the human condition? I mean, people always say, you know, I remember Michelle Obama, who I really, really respect. Uh, but she made a comment, something along the lines when there was something was going wrong or some, you know, some people were causing problems. And she said, we're better than that. And, I, you know, I, I don't think we are. I think some of us are. Uh, but I, I think there's a, a good deal of people that are not. And, um, uh I think they're what go ahead. I was going to say like humans like left alone usually are like a really beautiful native American tribe. That's at one with nature, you know, but then you have like a tribe like down, like um the, the, the Aztecs, you know, when that tribe like really went bad was when they were smoking DMT, the, the yeah. lead, lead guy was doing DMT and having encounters with deities. So then human sacrifice became like the crazy thing. Graham Hancock has the entire lecture series on this. Yeah. It was it was DMT and the 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 talking with entities that turned them into a murderous like civilization. But like when you look at some of the great like Native Amer American tribes, you know, I it's not like I know all this stuff, but you just kind of look at some of them that are just like left on their own that aren't doing DMT necessarily. Maybe they do peyote, peyote. I have no idea, but I don't know. They just seem to be one with nature and loving each other and they're communal and they're figuring it out, you know? So yeah. I look at us now, the world is where the phenomenon wanted it to be. Like it's operating where it wanted it to be, in my opinion. I mean, because they got the technology, they've been around longer than we have. They've been managing the religions and the cultures and the, like the, the, they can put thoughts in our head. They can abduct us at night and put somebody else into the, the White House, if they wanted to, or to lead Germany, I, that they could, if you know, yeah. like, so, so I kind of go, we are what they want. Well, well, why? 
why do they want chaos? You know, that's kind of where my mind goes. Well, okay. Well, let's just stay with this extraordinarily negative feeling here because of this concept, because my next question is sort of the same thing. Um, Charles Fort, who I'm a big fan of, if, if, if our, our, any of our readership, I mean, our listeners out there haven't read Charles Fort, uh, he, he's not an easy read per se. He writes in sort of a Georgian type of style of writing. Uh, uh, we would call it stilted, but he, nevertheless, brilliant guy. But if you're going to read any one of his books, read the Book of the Damned. Um, and he said, uh, he stated there that, and I'll quote this, I, I think we are property. I should say we belong to something that once upon a time, this earth was a no man's land that other worlds explored and colonized here and fought among themselves for possessions, but that now it's owned by something. That something owns this earth. All others warned off. Frightening stuff. Where do you, you, you talked about this. Uh, I mean, how, how, how do you view the Fort set? I mean, this is, you know, a hundred and some years ago, you said it. I think there was a natural, a natural pale blue dot here creating life organically, beautifully. Something found it and rapidly evolved the life on the planet, mixing in its own genes and its own stuff to create an ecosystem where they can figure out very quickly which versions of their hybridization is stronger through war, chaos, religion, poverty, politics, culture. They just pitted everyone against each other. Let's change the skin color over here. Let's change the religion over here. Let's change the politics over here. And let's just have all these mystical experiences and get them all pitted against each other. But on their own accord, they will choose to act a certain way and we'll figure out who is the stronger and we'll, we'll rapidly evolve that. And then one day maybe we can merge with them or something. That tends to be where I go with this stuff. And it's like, it's almost like we are owned, but I think something kind of like usurped our natural evolution of life. And, and that's why I keep saying it is a negative thought, but honestly, it, the positive part of this is that it doesn't change the fundamental, the fundamental building blocks of who we are as humans, like having a connection to source and the stronger you build that fiber optic cable that it literally opens up infinite potential um, to where nothing else matters, like nothing else. Like people were leaving that movie Avatar. They they were yeah. like, you know, when James Cameron came out with Avatar, people were leaving and going. There were studies done on people that were literally really depressed because our world wasn't connected in nature the way it was perceived in that in that film. So people were literally spiraling because they they probably lived like, like in the eastern part of Detroit and it's like snowing outside and they have the worst jobs ever. And they just saw this beautiful movie. They're like, I want to live there. You know, but we can literally have that once we open, tear the bandit off and say, these are, there's these things that are coming here. These are the things that's interested in. These are the things that's done over history. This is how we've all pitted ourselves against each other. Uh, but the things we love most about humanity is still exists. You still are a physical body with a tether to, to a source and you can heal people and, and you can love people and you can help people and you can like move objects with your mind if you want like the force you know there's all these great things that can happen and that's where i think things get really good is is that's why we need to talk about this that's why i i think i think that's where the benefit is in ripping the bandit off here yeah good yeah i agree uh, one of the things i wanted to ask you here i have a favorite book one of my favorite books uh, on on the phenomenon on uaps is uh, a book called Alien Dawn written by Colin Wilson. And I think it was written back in 91 or something like that. But I, I must have read that book four times. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll you know, I'll get the quotes down and I'll think about it. In a way. But I, I have one I wanted, to, I wanted to talk to you about. There's a passage in the book that attempts to explain why so many people just don't seem to be interested in all of this. I mean, in the phenomenon and UAPs. Uh, and, I, you know... It, you and I know this is the story of the millennia, right? And you get these people like Dave Grush and Lou and Chris Mellon and, and Hal and Kid and Gary Nolan. We all know it's true. I mean, we all seen the evidence. It's 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 true. And and so uh, he, he this is what he said. This is what uh, uh, Colin Wilson said. He said one thing is clear to me that the reason my fellow humans take so little interest in these amazing problems of the paranormal or in whether aliens from uh, you know, other galaxies and dimensions are visiting our planet, is that they seem to be in a strange passive state that is akin to hypnosis. 
Now, I share enough of their state of mind to understand their longing for security and their objection to the intrusion of strangeness. strangeness. Nevertheless, it seems to amount to burying their head in the sand. Are most people guilty of burying their heads in the sand, Tom? Or could there be another explanation for people simply not wanting to consider this subject at all? I, I find this, this is one of the questions of the, uh, you know, of the times regarding this, this subject. Well, you got to look at in- instinct. Like, you know, why when, when a baby is born, why does it know how to root for the breast for milk? Like that's the one thing the baby knows or why, like, um, you know, does a fish when it's born know how to swim instantly? You know, it's like, so there's, there's these DNA level instincts that the second you're born, it's programmed that you know how to do something, you know, to survive. Um, I had a general once tell me that perhaps we were programmed to worship. And every once in a while, that piece of the code goes haywire and you get Galileo and Einstein and you get these crazy thinkers like it, like that, that kind of like, uh, oh shit, it didn't work on these individuals. And, and so there, there's a, so if I, if there, if we can, if a baby can be programmed somehow or have programming to root for the breast right out of the womb, then why can't we be programmed to not look up and just, it's all gone. It's, it's like, there, there's nothing up there. There's nothing to look at. Um, now I, I thought that was weird because you and I find this so, so fascinating. So like if someone tells you and I about this shit, we have like a thousand questions and our quest, our quest for more knowledge is like never ending. But I met somebody. I, I remember like the, uh, you know, I can't say who it is, the, but picture one of the biggest directors that has ever existed in Hollywood. And I was talking to his office about Secret Machines, our book about getting this off the ground. And the head of film, the head, the head person that, that does like the development for the projects that this person directs, I had a relationship with her and I was talking to her. And I finally said, look, I'm, and this is before I knew you. I was like, I, I'm working with these guys um, and they're all very serious guys. And this is a story that's really important. It's real. And I really want to get this on this person's desk and whatever. And the and this lady freaks out. She starts getting really nervous. She starts going, oh, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I, and I stopped and I said, hold on a second. Wait, 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 calm down. Wait, do you think I'm lying? And she goes, yes, yes, I do think you're lying. I'm all, you think that I'm lying about this group of generals and other important people that really believe that this story has importance and value and that I'm going to take that and make it all up and come to your office with this guy that your boss is like the biggest name ever. I'm like, why, why would I do that? Like, wait, what are you talking about? She goes, I don't know. I don't know. And she hung up. So something was clicking in her brain that was super scared, didn't want to believe it, concocted a whole story that I was lying about it and frantic. It, it was the first time that I saw like a programming. Now, granted, that could have come from religion. That could have come from childhood. That could have come whenever. But at least I saw, like, a wall that to to something that to me and you was like, I want to know more. Sign me up. Like, let's get a couple beers. Give me eight beers. I need to know more about this. But to this yeah. person, it was like, do not bring it up. I want nothing to do with that knowledge. I don't even want to think about that. And um, it takes me back to the conversation with the general, bringing up the idea of being pre-programmed to worship. You know. That were that that just like a baby coming out of the womb, and it's got a programming to find the nipple. We come out of the womb, we're ready to worship something and give it all, give it, you know, put the whole story in this one basket of fruit. <laughs> you know, like everything is about Christianity, or everything is about you know Islam, or everything is about this. But it's also, but within that, there are no UFOs. There is nothing out in space. We are the only ones, and a human created the earth, and he wears a toga. <laughs> you know, and and they're fine with that. You know that like. I, I just think it's crazy. I, I don't know. That's just me. Like when I see a politician running for president now and they're talking so strongly about their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, I grew up in that religion. Like I know a lot about that religion and I kind of go with Hubble or, or, you know, where they did the deep space project with project with Hubble, they, 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 they let it focus on a grain of sand in the darkest part of space for 11 days. One grain of sand. If you held a grain of sand at like arm's length, and focus on that one pinpoint for 11 days with the Hubble Space Telescope. We got a one inch by one inch slide that had 10,000 galaxies in it. Yeah. Like this is real science. This is really verifiable. This is a big deal. But yet guys are still running for president as though a white dude in a toga created the universe. And I I just kind of go, we should be, 
why are we doing that? Because we're programmed to or something like something's in might be in our DNA to just not want to like accept this information. But every once in a while, DNA goes weird and guys like you and me in the same breath as Galileo and Einstein, of course, you know, of course. we're natural, well, right? goes wrong and we're just more curious, you know? So, um, I don't know. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a wild. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, you know, from, uh, an English poet, well, American, uh, actually written in, in England, but his name, uh, uh T.S. Eliot. And I think it was in the four quartets, his poem, but he, he was talking about it. One of his phrases was mankind cannot bear too much reality. And, and I think that right. that's really what this is here. I, th I think, I think a lot of people can say, look, I, I, I can barely get through my day, you know, with, with, you know, with my spouse and my kids and my job and everything else. I, I don't have time to think about this. It's, it's a luxury that I, I just don't want to think about. And it's also challenging, you know, challenges the, their belief systems sometimes. And, um, they just, I guess they don't need the extra aggravation, but um, let, let me let me let me jump to another thing here. You know, one of my I, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting uh, this religious scholar, Je Dr. Jeffrey Kripal, and Jeff Jeffrey he and uh, Whit uh, Whitley Strieber have written a couple books together. But uh, Jeff teaches at Rice University, but he he wrote a book uh, a while back called "Authors of the Impossible: uh, The Paranormal and the Sacred States." And it was about, you know, Jacques Vallée and a couple other people that that dealt with, you know, par uh, uh, paranormal episodes and things along those lines. But this is what uh, Dr. Kripal said. He said, nothing in our everyday experience gives us any reason to suppose that matter is not material, that it is made up of bizarre forms of energy that violate, very much like spirit, all of our normal notions of space, time, and causality. Yet when we subject matter to certain drastic treatments like CERN's Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland, then we can see quite clearly that matter is not material at all, that there is no such thing as materialism, and that this world is way, way weirder than we thought. You've been talking about this for a long time. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like I thought that was a wonderful quote. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I That's the thing. I was like, every time we get stuck in our jobs and we get depressed about the way things are and i mean it's like literally nothing is as it seems and and i i think that <clears throat> uh our attachment to material items and our attachment to the way things are supposed to work and our and our constant need to control our environment control our job control our kids control our friendships control control it's like it, nothing is in control and the 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 the, the quicker you except that you're not in control of anything and that nothing is as it seems, the happier your life is going to be. And this is why I think like, uh, if we were to really change the future, the, if I was like, if I came in and I was the president of the United States and I had both houses of Congress and everyone's aligned, I would, the two things I would do, the very first two things I would do is number one is I'd bring all the UFO information out so everyone on earth can trust the fact that we've all been duped over thousands of years to believe whatever the fuck we were supposed to believe to be pitted against each other. And the second thing I would do is I'd spend like the amount of money we spent on fighting the war in Afghanistan, a trillion dollars. I would literally go and find the biggest artists in Hollywood to create interactive documentaries on the shit we need to know and re-educate, re redo the entire education system to where you're not learning calculus all the time and doing all these with all this weird shit you don't need to know, but you're learning how to take care of the earth. You're learning how to get along with other people. You're learning a little bit more psychology, you know, about why you're the way you are and, um, and start from the ground up because everyone goes, you know, kid, we can't tell everyone about UFOs because it's too dark. It's too scary. Well, we tell kids that they're going to burn in hell for eternity. If they have sex outside of marriage, we tell kids that a guy was nailed to a cross and stabbed with a knife and fucking thorn the blood on his head. Like we tell kids that demons are going to come and take their souls when they sleep. And this fucking Lucifer is a big serpent fucking th I mean, we tell kids the gnarliest shit. So I think they can handle this too. So I think like if we were able to tell everybody, you know, that life is a little bit different than we thought. And we we're able to, to, to set up our education system in a way that we're actually learning things that benefit, like, you know, be more empathic, more compassionate, learn how to grow a garden, learn why somebody that acts a certain way is probably because they've been abused and maybe you were yourself and, you know, like a little bit managing humanity, you know, um, I think that within one generation we would do 
really well. Plus, if I was to learn math from someone like Seth Rogen, I think it'd be a lot funnier and cooler, and I'd probably retain the information a lot better. <laughs> They're just like a boring, a boring math teacher in Pocatello, Idaho, is trying to teach me some algebraic equation I don't give a fuck about. But I don't know. So I just think that's what we should do. Okay, I'll go. I'll go along with that. Listen, I got one one more UAP question that I want to ask you two quick questions at the end here, but uh, about to the stars. But uh, I, I think both of us would agree the most sane, well-read people have come to the conclusion that UAPs are indeed real. I mean, you, you if you read the literature, is you just can't walk away from it. What you know, and without having believed this is indeed real, have you given much thought to the possibilities? that UAPs in particular it could be psychic projections or do you think they are more material phenomenon? Yeah, I definitely don't think they're psychic projections. Are they just kind of figments of our imagination? Like a, a group of people all believe they're going to see something and then it shows up uh, versus something that's actually physical. I do believe it is physical. I do believe it that it's it's being picked up on radar. It's interacting with our our military. It's had crashes and there's things to gather and analyze, but I also think that its intentions of what it's trying to achieve is only, they only get what they need through the free will choice of our psych, you know, our psychological behavior. So like it plays a part in it, like our consciousness in what we think and what we feel and what we do plays a major component into what it needs. And I, and I think, I think that if that, again, that boils back to, I think that we are being pitted against each other to create a lot of chaos to, because what happens when you make decisions out of fear? Like if you're really scared of something, like you're going to make decisions that are really mundane decisions where you might not leave your house. You might not date somebody. You might scream at someone you love. You might, I mean, everything, if you were a really scared individual um, and had trauma in your life, you end up really kind of hurting the, yourself and the people around you because everything you see is through that lens. So what happens when the entire earth is seeing life through that lens? You really end up decreasing your humanity and decreasing your consciousness. You're not evolving versus somebody that, like there was a guy that was like a Navy SEAL that was going to one of these natural paths that I knew that was com contemplating committing suicide. I mean, he's just seen way too much death and his friends died and all the war he's been in and he's had to kill people and nothing was helping him. And so the naturopath doctor says, I'm not really allowed to tell you this, but I think you should go do mushrooms. I think you should do the biggest mushroom trip ever, as deep as you can go and see what happens. So this guy comes back a year later. He's wearing a tie-dye shirt. He started like a fucking, like this place where all these military guys go after war. They all do mushrooms. They all meet their maker and they're all full of love and compassion. So you kind of go one of two ways. You either get closer to source or you get further from source with pain and trauma. So I guess my point is, is like, Again, it boils down to the the intentions and what it what it needs from us, UFOs in general and its occupants. It needs us to make our own decisions in a state of chaos because over time it'll decrease our attachment to source and then we will be able to be used and utilized by that consciousness in a way that we probably don't even understand. Maybe it's a form of possession, you know, like coming into our bodies. Maybe it's a form of hacking the energetic source of our soul where it can be a part of that. Um, who knows, but maybe it can't achieve any of that if we're super aware of what it is and we're super in love and we're like compassionate and we're like hippies and growing like, you know, like the native American tribe that's at one with nature or the movie avatar where we're connected to animals and to plant life. And we look at everything as beauty. You know, if we're really, really evolved, Maybe it has no chance to inhabit, but if it can deceive us and we make weird decisions to end up further away from source, then it can come in. And if it wanted to do that really fast, what better way than to have World War One, World War Two, World War Three, terrorism, like murder, like like skin color issues and religion issues, and that's that's the way I think. So these are the crazy answers. So I got a big kick out of you because I know you make fun of boomers all the time, of which I am one. You sound uh, really, I was a hippie. I mean, I, you could classify me as a hippie back in the old days. I had pierced ears, tattoos, the whole deal. And I talked about, you know, three things, you know, what you're talking about, right? Love, compassion, and forgiveness. And once you connect with that through the source, I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, we used to talk about the idea of awareness. So I think you're right out of money with all that. And, um, um, and I think that's probably why we got along so well when we first met. I, you know, I sort of saw that in you, that sort of a, uh, you know, kinder spitter. I'm certainly a lot older than you, but nevertheless, you seem to have an older 
older soul uh, than than most people um, that I've I've known in my lifetime. Uh, last question: What does your future look like? G- give me a quick description of the next five years of your life. Oh, okay. So uh, I got so Blink's going on tour this year. Obviously, we go in, we go down to South America and Australia, like February, March, April. We get to the U.S. in the summer. We do a few things in the uh, for a couple weeks in the in Europe. After that, um, <clears throat> and then I'm home, and I'm going to try direct like two to three of the films within the two years coming up. So after I get done touring this year, I go right into um, doing some movies. There might be a little bit of Blink stuff in 2025 that we're talking about, but um, I'm really like I've been working really hard over the past two years to get these scripts ready and to get monsters of California out there. And then we had the writer's strike where all the writers and then there's a, there was a, there's a director's strike, a producer. There's another strike. There's always some type of yeah. Hollywood strike where it puts everybody like just everyone's got a hold, you know? So that was about six to nine months of last year, but we are now ready to, uh, to do quite a lot. And, uh, and, and I'm really excited about it. So my goal is, is finish up the touring and jump right into directing at least two, if not three films right away. Well, listen, once again, Tom, thank you so much for your time and best of luck with the tour. And so we're going to wrap up this session of TTS Talks. All of the Secret Machines books are available at todestars.media. You can stay up to date with Two to Stars by finding us on social media, Instagram at todestars.media, Twitter or X at todestars.media, and Facebook at todestars, Inc. Again, Thanks for tuning in to TTS Talks. A special shout out to Carrie DeLong, Lisa Clifford, and AC Catrone for all their help and assistance. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast, rate and review us over at Apple Podcasts, and we will catch you next time for episode 14 of TTS Talk.